Welcome to the New Books Network. Good morning, good evening, good night, NBN Entrepreneurship and Leadership. Personally, I'm fascinated by the story. Trust is an underrated weapon in the business landscape. I'm a really, really strong believer in learning by doing. What's the definition of success? You're trying to come up with an answer to the question. But go ahead, Richard. Uh, you could be right, but you're wrong. <laughs> good morning, good evening, good night, whatever time of the day it is. Entrepreneurship and Leadership New Books Network podcast listeners. Today we've got Veronique Oskaya, if I pronounce your name correctly, Veronique. Pretty good. Veronique Oskaya. There's a little uh, umlaut okay, that, on the... That, that's the, who we've oh. got, who's the CEO of Argos Multilingual. And Veronique, good afternoon. Uh, how, how would you introduce yourself, if, if not the way I did it? Well, you, I think you did very well. I'm Veronica Skaya. I work in the localization industry, and I'm currently CEO at Argus Multilingual, one of the leading uh, agencies in the in the field of localization. Exactly. And um, those that did, don't know what localization is, yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah. go. It's well. It's basically. I mean, it's translate. We're translating. Uh, we actually. So yeah, Veronica and I work in the same company, but uh, we're translating. <laughs> she's the boss, uh, and uh, but but we, we do translate um, content um, into multiple. We basically help companies export their products and services into all the countries of the world. Yes, and and just to declare an interest, and uh, when Kimon stopped being the CEO of this company was when you took over. So you've got the former CEO and the current CEO on the call. And I will be talking mainly about you, Veronique, and obviously the company will come into it. And um, did you, and, and so if you go back a bit in your mm-hmm. your life, could you describe your, your childhood and your upbringing? Because you're quite multi, multi-ethnic. Did you grow up in one country <laughs> or around? I, I always struggle to remember <laughs> myself, so you can remind us. Sometimes I struggle to remember myself. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm a French national. Um, my father is French and my mother is half uh, Belgian, half Dutch. And they met in Belgium somewhere, probably in a nightclub, you know, and, uh, and they ended up getting married. And my mom moved to France. Um, my, my mother was a, a qualified midwife. But at the time, you didn't have a diploma conversion from one country to another. So she ended up working in my father's business. And my, my dad's side of the family, they've always been very much entrepreneurs. So they had a business of um, horticulture, so plants and flowers and all of that, and you know, supplying to whatever businesses and, and also um, general public. And that was kind of a family business that was handed in. So this from is like a florist? And, like, a, like what we would Yeah, yeah, but a, a big scale. So thousands okay. and thousands of plants right. and okay. flowers and all that. Like with the big things. farm behind it. and then, Exactly. Yeah. And the glass houses and all yeah, of that yeah, stuff, yeah. right? And so as a kid, I was very much exposed to this entrepreneurship because they had their own business. But it also kind of showed me the side that is not so glamorous, which is the long hours, working weekends, not taking vacation when everybody else was taking vacation because summer was their high season, right. you know, all of that stuff. And I thought, wow, it's hard work. Plus I worked with them. So in the summers, you know, my family's philosophy say, well, you're going to, uh, you know, learn quite early what it takes to make money literally. So for my summer holiday, I had one, one month I had to work and one month I could you know, Ooh, basically be on, on holiday. Uh, yeah. And, and my dad used to kind of, you know, put me in a glass house and show me what to do. Right. And he would show me for 10 minutes and then I would be by myself for the rest of the day to kind of whatever, do the, do the work. So I know how to prune all sorts of plants. Yeah, and but, when, and but, when, but when did they put you in front of the clients? They did put me in front of the client. <laughs> they put me in front of the clients when I was about 15. So we had also like, so there was like the, 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 the business was like kind of, you could call it cash and carry. You know, the big thing, right. the, the, the trucks would come and take, you know, whatever, thousands of plants and go to Paris. But they also had like the, the shop. And I was in the shop from, a, you know, from about 15, right? But and what, and I kind of like that. But you, one of the lessons you learned was, you know, quite often people who've gone into business, they go into business and they have nothing in their background. Sometimes they say, well, my mother or my father was a great role model. And But in, you, in one way, the lesson you learned was maybe – Entrepreneurship wasn't wasn't for you as the first choice. Is that correct? It's correct because I mean to be you know in with my childhood perspective, I kind of envied the kids of the doctors or the lawyers down the street who had it a little bit easier. In retrospective, I think what my dad did was smart. 
because he kind of taught me lesson of life very early. And, you know, and it, it was enjoyable, but I knew that, oh, maybe it's not for me. Uh, so it kind of gave me a different direction. Did you like it when you were in the shop? I'm just curious, like that I part. I did, I did. And people were always like, I found that I also like dealing with the annoying customers and trying to solve things. So I, I like the diversity. And that was kind of a key because it was never the same. And, you know, people may, I don't know, they would have a wedding, they would have this, they would have that. So you, you do different things. But then it made me think, hmm, I didn't like stuff that was too repetitive. And I knew I didn't want to stay in my hometown. It was a small town, northern France. Right. And so I said, I need to study something that's going to get me out of here. <laughs> and so, I, I, it's, it's so often the case that the major impetuses to do things in your life is like, I don't want to carry on doing what I'm doing. There's, the, I need a change. And, you know, it's not always that, but it's so often the case, isn't it? Exactly. And, and everybody was studying kind of, I don't know, 50 miles away from, from home. And I said, no, 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 I'm going far. So I went about 500 miles or so. Like to, I went to the south of France, actually, to, to study. And I studied um, international politics. Actually, I wanted to be a diplomat because I thought, I'll travel. I definitely won't be in my hometown. Won't be boring. So you're so passionate I, then uh, uh, to, of like cultures and travel and languages. Like what, what, yeah. what? Like why, um, why, like you know why what? do you think that was? <laughs> Um, because when I started studying English in school, I kind of found it fun to be able to communicate another language. I got, you know, now I'm going to show off a bit, got first prize in English, you know, when I was like, I don't know, 12, 13. And I won a prize on a trip to the UK. No way. Uh, and, I, and I went to Cambridge. Mm. Right? Very, so that very, was, very and, good and, city. Very good city. Right? <laughs> that's where Richard, that's where Richard graduated, just to be, oh, let's, uh, you know, I kind of thought full there disclosure. was a link there. <laughs> mm. um, and, and it kind of also opened my eyes, you know, so this time, this kind of teenage time was kind yeah. of interesting, right? Because I went, huh, and this is fun here, England, and the people are different. And No, were your parents, different. like, were your parents, so you said they were working all the time, they didn't have that time for vacation, so you didn't really get the internet, like, they weren't, you know, they were, obviously they were somewhat international being, but, you know, it's cross-border, northern France, Belgium, and Holland. And, yeah, and uh, my, my grandmother, my grandmother, she had an apartment in Spain, so she would take me from, ah. so I spent actually my, 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 I, I didn't spend my summer vacation with my parents. It was either with an aunt, with my grandma, with cousins or whatever. So are, you so I, are you an only child? No, I have a younger sister. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. And, uh, and initially she was going to stay in the business. And then she also, she took a different, a different path. But initially she was going to stay in the business. And um, were you on any, so. were, did that disappoint your parents? Were they quite happy for you to go off and do your own thing? Or did, they, <laughs> did you have to feel a little bit of pressure? It's a pity. Who's going to take over from us? That kind of stuff. Never had that pressure. They sold the business. And, and, I, and I have to say that from my mom's side, my mom was like, yeah, do what, you know, she, she kind of felt like I was always like, you know, like quite good in school, whatever. Like I, I, I was quite decent. She, she saw a lot of potential there academically. And she actually encouraged me. My dad was a bit more like, oh, no, stay close. She was like, no, no, spread your wings and off you go. Nice. Um, yeah. mom. And so then you ended up choosing diplomacy just in yep. your head you were thinking this is yep. my ticket to travel exactly. around um exactly. and, and what is diplomacy i can't even imagine what does diplomacy study look like <laughs> what is so that? i i learned everything there is to know about you know history you know like all the you know the wars the alliances the you know the the the, the all of the treaties all of the you know all, and from i mean starting quite back in history to recent times. And, and that was quite interesting. And then I had one year in Ireland on Erasmus. And what was really cool there is that we were applying things to current affairs and analysis of you know, what was going on and you know, analyzing, for example, the Israelo, you know, a Palestinian conflict and stuff. And I thought, okay, that's kind of fun. And I got into the French embassy. So that was my first job. I got in okay. uh, as like assistant to the consul. Mm -hmm. And it was horrible. <laughs> it yes. was just horrendous. Well, um, for somebody like who knows you, uh, like I know you, uh, this dynamic, fast moving, <laughs> I can't imagine a worse environment um, for you than the, than, the, than the, actually, when you think back on it, the diplomatic, that could not, that you, you were so obvious, you look back and said, no way. <laughs> like that's, mm. In, at the time, we're talking the 90s, it yeah. was still extremely conservative. You needed the duster to just, you know, remove right, right, the cobwebs. Right. Very rigid. And I understood all in a second, 
how do I go from here? And basically I was told, well, you need to do about 10 to 15 years in really tough countries to kind of earn your stripes. So I had three years in Angola, you know, at the time that was not the place to be, uh, three years in Lebanon. And I was like, shoot, that's not what I, you know, and, there was and, a gap and, between my... <laughs> and Verini, how, how, how many hours or days or weeks did it take you to realize that this was a bad choice? Was it immediate or was it over a period of days or months? A month. A month. <laughs> exactly. So so what did you do? So then what? <laughs> so then, and I, and I, and I actually, I, I, I looked for advice, you know, I, 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 in, in, when I look back at my career, I've always thought that ask people, if you don't know, ask. I wish I had asked a bit more about this diplomatic course before, but when I was in the embassy, I kind of made friends with a couple of the, the ladies working there and, and they kind of told me things for what they were. And that kind of helped also open my eyes, right? And I thought, okay, I, I and, and I left after a few months without a job. I said, I'll figure it out. And, you know, you kind of pay rent, right? So I started teaching French in a business school. No qualifications. It was really MacGyver at the time, I have to say. Nice. But that was kind of fun. And uh, and I remember to look older than my students because this, they were the same age as me. I used to wear glasses even though I didn't need them. You know, I tried to kind of say, okay, it too, yeah, pay the rent. And then... I saw an ad for a job as a translator, English into French. And I said, okay, why not? Again, I didn't have that background. And I did the test and it was about, I never forgot, that was about hardware. I had never touched a computer at the time. So I had a friend and I asked again, you know, I, I said, hey, I need to learn about computers over the weekend. And he just said, oh my God. And he just took me into his office and he opened an old computer and showed me and I translated this test. And then when I got to the office uh, there and I, and I gave it, they called me two days later. They were really in need of, uh, of staff, I think, but they hired me. And they said, okay, the test is impeccable, but you don't understand the topic. <laughs> <laughs> which, like, was okay. true, which was true, which was true. It was totally true. And I, and I never tried to, you know, fob it or anything. I said, you know what, I do nothing about computers. And I got super lucky because the lady who was hiring me, she's still my friend today, she said, I'm going to help you. And that was like this, um, that's an informal mentor. That really what kind of got my foot in. And she went to work every day, two hours before the normal start time to teach me the ropes. For three to teach you translation. To teach you translation. Yeah. And editing and all the techniques and kind of also teach me about IT. Because at the time, the company was doing a lot of uh, technology translation. It was the model still where you had in-house translators. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then after three months, I got fired. Okay. Just let's take that firing moment to just take mm -hmm. a break. Sure. Just for people who are listening, they may not appreciate what Argos Multilingual is. Like everyone imagines that a translation company it might be a few restaurant menus or stuff like that. Could you just give a little sense of the scale of Argos now? Because you know Veronique's running one of the larger, larger businesses in the world that do this, and so I think I, although. Just as we listen to this story, I want people to appreciate where you've come, where you've got to from where you were. So just like jump to where you are now and then we'll jump back. Right. And so what we do at Argos is that, as Kimon was explaining, we help companies go global. Companies produce content. The content might be a piece of software. It might be a, a user's manual for, for, that, for that product or that software. It might be marketing communication, right? You're, you're, and your marketing communication can be a brochure about a product, but it can be an advertisement. It can be all sorts of things, right? It's website. So when you think about every single piece of content that you read or you listen to, if you want somebody in another country who doesn't speak English to have access to this, you need to translate, adapt that content. And that's what we do. And we work um, mostly in sectors like life science or so medical sector, manufacturing and technology. So to give you an example, we take a customer, the customer that's hard with the management. So the pacemakers that, you know, people will have it. Well, you want the doctor who's going to place your pacemaker if he's in Slovenia to have all of these instructions in Slovenian and not make a mistake when he, he or she places that pacemaker. We translate that content. So it means the translator, it's not, you know, Joe Blogs of the street who can do that. The translators have a specific degree in translation and a level of experience that enables them to provide that work. We manage this work. So if, Richard, you are, you know, a, a product manager in a big pharma company and you say, okay, I have this drug and it's going to be released in 50 countries, we manage that process of making sure everything gets translated, 
maybe formatted, you know, everything so that when you get your, your product back in the, in the 50 languages, it's ready to be actually shipped in the different countries. Okay, so so and that just gives a bit of context. So it's not it's not just the odd like the guy because if even if you wander down most streets in Krakow in Poland where 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 I and Kimon live, you see little signs that are saying translation in Polish, <laughs> and you can walk in with your with your will or some document, and you know you hand it over, and it's not that at all, really, is it? No, and we te- we work very much in the enterprise business, so it's really corporations who have formal needs that are that tend to be recurrent as well. One of the big trends we've seen in the business, I call that streaming content. So you've got nonstop content. And if you look at, you know, your, your daily life, content is produced in such an exponential way today. We actually only address part of the market. We, we, we address the corporate side of the market. Which is a funny anecdote. We have, uh, we do have an office. We have a big office here in Krakow and the, people have come, <laughs> I mean, over the years, over the years of the company, it happened many, many times. The people came off the street, into the, and we're, we're we're so not built for that. We don't even know how to handle that. I, I remember at the beginning they didn't know what to do, and finally I said we made a decision. Like you just have to tell them that our minimum, our minimum fee is because that just would like scare because the minimum fee was like crazy like more than like and they would get mad at us actually uh, we, we <laughs> they would yell at us for how could you charge that much we, that's, that's actually we like to draw out general business lessons that this is applicable across all industries the the nicest way to say we don't want to do business with someone is to have a very high minimum but they would fee, still get which mad, is Richard. like above uh, they'd get which, pissed they'd get pissed it's what this is you're stealing this is ripping people off how can you oh, we, oh, we, I, I, it's fifty thousand dollars for one yeah, day. No, <laughs> what I do rather than say no is I refer people and say, yeah, we would be quite expensive, whatever. Here, why don't I give you the contact of the person who can do it directly for you, right? Right, but and, Hermie, and I know this that, is like right. Yola in the reception. <laughs> she had to, <laughs> she yeah. had to deal, deal with this person off the street. So, and anyway. if I needed to do my birth certificate <laughs> translation, I wouldn't go to Argos. I know I would go to yeah. a small agency. That, again, it's back to specialization. Yeah, it is. Right. So. Okay. So, but the company you were working for back then, they you, you got fired. They, they needed in-house translators, right? They, right. They, so, right. so they would. They, First of all, Verney, that has to be the only time in your life you've been fired. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, I just what, what, what did you do wrong? <laughs> and and you know what? I uh, I don't think we twenty people got fired that day. All the in-house yeah. translators. There was an MA happening. We were just so young. We had no clue okay. what was going on. So the company we were working for got bought by a Dutch company. And the Dutch CEO manager came to Dublin. And that day, we didn't have a clue what was happening. It was a Friday. He fired 20 people on the spot. And he said, but he said, but it was in September. He said, but we want you to work till December because we had this big project for a, um, a company doing... Um, uh, software for architect, right? So it was a massive project. He said, well, we want all of the linguists to stay. We will pay you till December so we finish the project. And, and this was a moment where, you know, we're talking about lessons. I was very bold that day because my mentor, the one who helped me train out, she said, why are you being upset about? Think, what can you do? And she literally gave me this mental slap and said, don't wallow in self-pity. Do something about it. And I took the 20 linguists, we went for a drink. And I said, do we need to take it lying down? Or maybe we go on Monday morning, we all resign on the spot. And we say, if you want us to finish the project, you need to rehire us as freelance. And here's the rate, thank you very much. Nice leverage. Entrepreneurial moment, entrepreneurial (laughs) moment. Lever- I was thinking when you said, when you were telling the story, I was, I, that opportunity immediately popped into my head. I had no idea that you had done that. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, really? You just like this? <laughs> you know, you, 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 you do get that slap because, you know, you're young, you just started a job. It's not very nice to be fired. But then we thought, yes, leverage. And they need us, right? The leverage. They need us to finish this project. And what was interesting is that after we finished this project, a number of people really were resentful. To the company for being fired in the first place, and they moved on. I didn't have that. I actually stayed in that company, and I made a career. It became Lionbridge. Mm. So that was a which kind is of a wise uh, move. one of the biggest companies in yeah. the world for those. So, so, so you and a big group of people, you were invoicing the people you formerly 
worked for as employees, just as freelancers yes. for, for, yes. For, for three months. And that, yeah. that double, um, double what we were making. Double, so how, yeah. Veronique, did you get from, uh, so you just, so, so how did you, so you went, you said you, so you stayed in the company. So how did you get back in? And then how did you ultimately get outside? Cause, mm -hmm. cause uh, just for people to know the CEO of Argos doesn't do translations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, yes. And I mean, and in total, I did translation slash editing for six months in total in my career. Right. So when I got back in, the model had changed. So in, in our industry, the model in the, let's say, 80s, 90s, 90s, were still in-house translators. And then it shifted to outsourcing, meaning that you would use translators in country and you would manage this. So the translation agencies, the larger ones, like Limebridge at the time, like Argos today, it's really project management that you do. You organize, you orchestrate the whole process, right? And so I actually got back in as a kind of a language lead. I was basically responsible for all of the French language across all of the projects and products, right? So that was my first, first um, in. And then after a few months, there was an opening in project management. And I thought, okay, I've acquired those skills of managing across the board a number of people and of projects. I want to try that. So I did project management. And I, I mean, I have to say, I was lucky in a sense to always have great managers who recognize the work. So I didn't really kind of ask for it. And then I, 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 I kind of graduated to a, a production management. Um, How long were you in the project? How long did you do project management? I did about five, I'd say six, six seven years in total. So wow, good. Still, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. you really have that foundation because that's really the business is the core of what we do is really project management. People think of yes. us as translation companies, but we really are managing these complicated projects. And, and, and just um, again, we are going to work through your life, but I'd like to pick out particular points that sure. sometimes it's a real advantage for the boss, the leader to just look, have a sense of distance and not really understand like look independently at what the people working for them like you can be the boss of coke and not know how to make coca-cola or whatever on, on the other hand sometimes it's a real advantage to understand the the detail of the different processes involved and what would you say the advantage for you now is having when you've having done these different roles how does that help you be the boss now um i mean maybe kind of coming back on the the philosophy i like to be able to dive down and back up and mm -hmm. i think for me it's an advantage the CEO of Delta once said something that really struck, you know, and, and stayed with me. He said, I sometimes board a plane to see what's the experience as a passenger. I go on the tarmac and see how the engineers work. I sit in the cockpit with the pilots. I go at the desk with the people in the, you know, the, the desk people in the airport. And I like that because it's kind of getting that experience. It doesn't mean you understand, you know, what you need to do as an engineer, but you kind of appreciate what it takes. And what it gave me is that I have the greatest respect and appreciation for how hard it is to be a project manager, to be a linguist, to be, I, I did DDP, I did engineering, I did testing. As I say, it was a little bit MacGyver because we were in this stage where, you know, you rolled up your sleeves and you got whatever done to get the project out the door, right? And it was a little chaotic and a feeling of startup, but because you got your fingers in a lot of pies, you understood. And I also understand that how it evolves with tech, technology, and so on. But I do, when I talk to a project manager, I know, you know, I might, I'm not saying I could do it today. Huh? That's not the point. But I understand that the business challenges they have to deal with in terms of delivering on time, in terms of customer service, et cetera. So I find it helpful. And what I typically do, and, and, and Kimon does that too, is that I have one-to-ones with different individuals across the company. And I ask them questions because if I don't do that, then I think I stay too remote from what's going on. So it's this balance in understanding what's happening on the ground with our customers, with our staff, and also being able to take this, elevate it, and kind of think through what to do with this because it actually feeds into our, our not just our strategy, but how we operate and how we develop the company. Correct. Yeah, I'd, think, I'd, I'd add to that. There's, there's uh, I'd add to that, Richard. I'd yeah, add ahead. one more thing because I think uh, another thing you use it for, Bernie, that you didn't mention, that I think you use it for all the time is clients. Is you understand the clients. If you're once you're in that production space, um, if you just are brought in as a salesperson, 
um, to talk to the client about their, about the client's problems, you really don't understand the client's problems as well as somebody who's actually on the production side. And so being able to create in, and that now you as a CEO is as somebody who creates vision and creates the future of the company. I know that this is a valuable tool for you to, un, that you, it helps you understand clients, which then helps you create services and ways in marketing and positioning going forward. So I think that's a, it's also a huge, like the client side. So certainly, and there's yet another aspect of this, which I, I think, and I know you're you're very very modest, but I and I think you can be a leader without having done the job. But it really helps get the respect of the people in the organisation if you know that you, some stage in your past, you sat in their shoes. It's it, it's possible to manage people without that, but if you if you've done what they do now, they will warm to you more because they they feel more understood. And part of leading people is understanding them, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely. And if I hadn't had this experience, I know that probably my first couple of months on the job, if I came from you know outside the industry, would have been to sit on the production floor mm-hmm. and like watch and ask questions right. so, and, sorry. and try and to I, understand. I, I, I'm having yet another thought here, which is to do with process efficiency as well, that sometimes when I'm, I'm mentoring people, I ask them to if I know that they're going to be having to manage other people doing a particular task, I say, do it yourself for an hour and just time yourself so you know you can do that 40 times in an hour. Because if, if then they say it takes it takes me, I can do two per hour. And if sometimes the differences are not marginal, they're enormous. And if you say, that's ridiculous, you can buy, buy a t- plane ticket in 30 seconds because I've done it. Someone says they need to go and buy a plane ticket and they need an hour. So do, do you find that you're at the level where you're, you're, you're looking for operational efficiencies or do you delegate that to other people in the organization? Um, I, I pick up on some of those. And then, of course, I trust I mean, we have brilliant people in the company and they have this mentality. Um, just to give you an example, I had a, a conversation not so long ago with one of our, one of our, uh, uh, one of our staff and he was mentioning to me something very, you know, it was a little bit of a detail, right, on a process, but he was explaining to me how instead of spending 15 minutes, he could have it down to five. And then what I asked him is, that how do you scale that? How much, how do you apply this? How much can you apply it to? And then actually you take that and you say, hold on a second, that's in one part of the process. How do we extend that? So definitely I, 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 I pick on some things and I ask, are we already doing that? And sometimes it's, yes, we already are. And sometimes, I don't know, actually, we haven't picked up on that. Why? Because, you know, work is ongoing. And, and I think that to my level, I, I can contribute a little bit in this standing back and looking. And other people are doing this in the organization, thankfully. But this is kind of um, this is kind of fun part for me also of the job, uh, to be able to really see what's under the, the hood or the bonnet. I'd like to, uh, I, I didn't ask, I forgot. There was a question I wanted to ask actually when we, we flew through your, your early years. Uh, and, I, and this is something I don't know about you. So I'm kind of actually genuinely curious about <laughs> it as well. Is that like, did you uh, play sports or were you, would you, I mean, would you consider yourself a competitive person and, and how did it, how did it manifest you, itself? You won the prize. I noticed you smiled when you said you got the scholarship or you won the prize to go to the UK. So I I'm noticed there's terrible. a little flash of competitive. <laughs> I am terribly, I am, I'm, I am I, such a bad loser. I am terribly competitive. <laughs> my, my, on, a, on, a, on a trip, it was not our honeymoon trip, but a couple of years into marriage, we went on a holiday with my husband. We had taken up tennis, right? And I did tennis when I was younger. My husband was very annoying because he was extremely talented at it from the get-go. Never have touched a racket before. Oh, so you we both, played. okay. <laughs> uh-huh. And then we went to this, whatever, on, on vacation and we we're on the tennis court. And he was just like playing like I was like much stronger, you know, physically than I was. Yeah. And I got so annoyed. I just threw the racket. And you know what he did? A smart man. He picked up the racket and said, let's go have a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I did sports and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sore loser. I, yeah. Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the founder and editor of the New Books Network. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably love to read. I know I do. So I'd like to recommend you subscribe to Scribd. Scribd is the ultimate reading subscription service, letting you explore all of your interests in any format you choose, ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more for only $9.99 a month. All your favorite things are there. 
you get an entire library for less than the cost of a single book. No complicated credit cards or additional purchases required. If you're not sure what to read, Scribd combines the latest technology with the best human minds to recommend content that you'll love. Want to change things up? You're free to switch between titles, genres, and formats at any time on your phone, tablet, or computer. And here's the best news. Right now, Scribd is offering NBN listeners a free 60-day trial. Go to try.scribd.com slash NBN for your free trial. That's try.scribd.com slash NBN to get 60 days of Scribd for free. And uh, does that, uh, do, we, do, you, do you let your kids win? My my yes yes I'm kind of I don't know actually, actually I don't when they were when they were when they were very small when they were very small I would let them win and they picked up on like did you let me win they didn't like it and now uh, no you know so so now do you let them win no 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 I mean come on like once they passed probably age seven that was over <laughs> so in the board game whatever you play Monopoly or oh, you no, play no, any no, board no, games no. those if are... you play you're gonna play serious you know we play. Uh, we play poker, we play tarot cards, you know, like we're serious. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Richard, let's go back. I just, it's a little, I, I, a little, uh, you can, we, I digress the thing. So I, I mean, uh, to, to, in the current context, um, as well as uh, leading Argos, you invested a significant amount of money and we're, we're business partners, you're shareholders now. And so um, did you always have that as a, as a goal to be like a, a to be co-own and because you know it's, it's one thing to work for other people and be successful it's another thing to be a, a co-owner and I'm just wondering whether you had in mind that was something that you might do or you really wanted to do like just in terms of how you felt about that and role maybe you can just before as you get to that because prior I don't remember either your person your situations in the previous where we were there equity deals and stuff like that. maybe you had something before I don't remember exactly right the, so so may, if I kind of step back you know to that time when i finished in production I, because i think that's maybe a, something interesting um you know the sales part so the reason i moved into then from production into sales was because i was getting frustrated with salespeople because i felt they were not doing their homework and i had a few episodes where we would go to a meeting and i would have prepped them and given them insights and they would put their foot in it at the customer meeting on really basic things that they should have known and i felt they're very distant, but they're the ones kind of making the commission and making the deals, but they're not making that effort to really help the customer. So this was kind of this change moment in my mind. I said, well, maybe I can do it. You know, I know what we're selling and, and I, I have the customer at heart. You know, I want to do good for them. Um, so that's how I transition. But the interesting thing, you know, in terms of leadership, I should have asked for the job and I didn't. I actually got headhunted. By you're, company. You're, about, you're about 30 years old now, I guess. I was so. like, I was late, late 20, yeah, just, just about 30, right, exactly. And, uh, and, I, and I got this job in a startup to be whatever, sales associate now. And I got a call from the CEO of Lionbridge. And I was like, why is he calling me, you know? And he said, I heard you resigned. And we were quite a big company at the time. And you know? we, we, we had a couple thousand employees. So I was like, wow, I'm getting oh, wow. a call. And he said, um, why didn't you tell me that you wanted no, yeah, to do right. sales? I'm like, yeah, I was going to pick up the phone. Hey, Rory, how are you doing? You know, like I have this, uh, uh, and you know, and so I kind of, uh, I, I thought, oh, Rory, whatever. And he said, we will create a job for you. I want you to stay. Yeah, but let's give, let's give that guy, let's give Rory some props here because um, I, I, on the one hand, you say that the company maybe missed the opportunity um, on some level to offer it, but they realized they were going to lose a talent and they went back and they got it. And that's ultimately the end result. Cause that's, exactly. for me in business, it's actually, who cares how you got there? You got there, you got, you her. got there. You didn't lose no. there. You didn't lose no. her. You got her basically. No. So. And then I was like a year of be careful what you wish for. You might just get it because it was hell. I didn't know what to do. And that's where I felt really having somebody to help me mentor, tell me what to do would have been great. I had to figure it out. Okay. Anyway, it worked long story short. I became super successful in sales. I was like number one salesperson at the whole of Lion Bridge because of all my friends in the organization. Because the fact that I had built this network, people trusted me. And this and was I the biggest it. company, right, Veronique? I mean, you yeah, were the, yeah, yeah. the most successful salesperson of yeah. the most successful yeah. translation yeah. localization company yeah. in the world. So that's a, yeah. just my, a my, my, 
my first year, I brought like just shy of half a million dollars of business. And they told me I failed because my quota was two million. <laughs> it's like, oh, man. And, you know, again, you were talking about character and resilience. I said, you know, I don't like failing. You know, that's a bit like this. Not hitting your target. Say, yeah, not hitting the target. I, I'm, I'm not pleased with that. So I just stuck at it. But anyway, and, and so I, I got to that and I really liked it. And then, it's, then it's, I, I took more responsibility. Back to your question on ownership at the time. Limebridge became public. And I kind of like this feeling of, you know, I was a shareholder and, you know, and your bonus or whatever was a mix of cash and share options and, and all that stuff. And, and, and that I, I, that was always at the back of my mind. I thought that was interesting. Um, and I always did that had turn out to be very, did that turn out to be very lucrative for you? That those uh, what, the, was, it was quite, quite good. Yeah. I, I, I have to say that my regret was, you know, again, overachiever, not to have been more senior earlier because I would have had a bigger, <laughs> a a bigger, bigger, bigger thing. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Because I saw also some of the, you know, senior colleagues, you know, did super well. Uh, yet, I think it was a very, um, a very smart way, you know, they were public so then, but it was a very smart way of keeping the talent and of making you feel like you're part of that story. Uh, the two companies I went to after, that was not the case. And for me, it was a little bit of a problem because I was getting also to a level of maturity and influence on the business where I thought, man, you know, um, I, I just didn't want the cash and recognition. Cash was very good. But I felt that um, maybe you have a slightly different behavior. Your engagement is maybe a little bit stronger. Um, so, so, so that. And then my, my, before Argos, um, so I was CEO of a company. We, we sold the board, you know, board owned company. Um, it was a privately held company. They sold to a uh, to another uh, to a private equity, and that was really really insightful because then I really kind of saw the whole mechanics of that of you know how the goals were set, uh, how the strategy was set. Not necessarily that I agreed with all of it, but it was super interesting to actually understand the whole the whole um, uh, the whole mechanics. And in that organization, as a uh, as a staff member, you could get some equity. Right. So you, you, you could buy some equity, but there was a cap on it. Right. So it was like, no, no, you cannot own too much of the company. <laughs> and, <laughs> but and definitely, also, I think it gives you it, it, I could see the drive of like in that previous company. I also saw the drive of the ones where, you know, um, equity owners. And, and in a sense, I, I think there is a way of looking at a, a career as being an entrepreneurial process. You're a, you're a person who can offer a set of services and value to the employer and you're looking for where you can have the most impact. And, you, and it's very important, the company choosing which companies you work for, that, you know, many people listening, that the average age of someone starting a business is uh, in the Harvard Business Review, it's 43 years old. It's people who've done something and they've got a skill set, they've been aware of some opportunity. And, and you know, then but your was... Lionbridge, a good company. Did you feel like it was a growing market? You had a senior position, so it was a good opportunity to represent them as a salesperson for a, for a period of your life, right? It was a, a company that had the feel of like anything can be done. I have to say that, you know, it was my corporate upbringing, the American style. So my mindset was always, yes, we can, we'll figure it out. And I remember I had this fantastic operations manager in Dublin. And, you know, when I was like a, a, a quota carrying salesperson, I would come to her and I never wanted to sell something where we couldn't make money because yeah, I had been in production. I knew what it meant. Right. And she used to always say to me, Vero, sell it, we'll figure it out because the trust was there. And that to me was like a big lesson of like build trust in the organization and people will go to the moon and back for you and vice versa. Uh, and it was definitely a feeling of kind of startup. There was, I mean, we were growing there was um, very low attrition also in the company and, 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 and serious skills. What, what kind of was a change moment was a big M&A. And that was a lesson for me in M&A. Culture. Do not overlook. the Don't just look at the spreadsheet and the cash and the money and the shares. Because if you just, you know, don't look at that cultural and fit, you know, aspect, you're going to go in the wall. And I've seen this so many times. Lionbridge, I remember the CEO once on stage talked about the successes and the failures. And in his failure part, a big chunk was about a number of acquisitions where all the staff was gone by the time he spoke and all the customers were gone. 
right? Mm. So that for me, and, and it completely changed, that, that I mean, it completely changed the culture. To me, it gave me a very clear, not even a sense for me, <laughs> it was verbalized that to go further in the organization would take five years. And I said, heck with that. You know, I'm not going to wait five years to have another opportunity. So then I went to a company where they gave me the opportunity um, and they said, and there you were talking about skills. They saw the transferable skills as being able to scale a business, right? They were in a stage where they said, okay, we've gone to a certain level of success. How do we go to the next chapter? We don't have the people in house who know how to do that. So that's basically what, you know, the skills that I kind of, um, that, that they bought uh, mm. from and, and it doesn't matter, no matter how successful or how big a company is, there are always challenges and opportunities, right? You, you can be number one and then staying number one is hard. You can be a mid-tier company and staying there is hard. And in terms and the translation industry is quite, um, there are quite a lot of women in senior positions. There are quite a lot of women around in translation generally. Is it true in senior management or was it true in Lambridge or was it, was it a bit unusual for someone uh, to be as senior as you uh, who's female? Um, Lionbridge? before that acquisition, in my opinion, was an example of inclusion. And that again came from the top. It came from the CEO at the time. The COO was a woman, the legal counsel was a woman. I was, you know, VPs in, I was VP in sale. I, we had quite a lot of women in high position. And he used to have, maybe it was an unconscious bias, I don't know, but he kind of said, oh no, no, the women in this organization, they get so much done. You know, that he, he, he really saw the talent. When the MA happened, it was the opposite. It was extremely conservative. It, it was a really, as I say, the culture meant that you saw all the doors closing in front of you, unfortunately, because part of it, because you were a woman. Um, yeah, this is touching. Yeah. <clears throat> you're touching now, and they're like super interesting. And I want to ask you how you, because, okay, as a man in the localization industry, I've never thought about this. I mean, I've, I've been aware, I've been aware that it's been, uh, I've, I am fully aware that it's a mostly woman run, mostly women. There are more women, I believe, than men working. In and in Argos, we have a 60, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, about 63% of our yeah, staff is, and, is women. And, and, and it, like, I don't know, I guess it's just the way I never, ever thought in terms of men and women. I never thought in terms of, I just never thought. Neither did I that. until that day. <laughs> I just like the best person, if the best person, whoever the best person is. Yeah. And yeah, we always had lots of, of women in, in senior positions, but, but just throughout your career, because let's just take it all the way back. Mm -hmm, I mean, throughout mm -hmm. your career, because I think this is just interesting. Like, uh, did you feel much or any discrimination or any difficulty in, you know, breaking through? Because you were the CEO once also, by the way, I mean, of, a, mm -hmm, you know. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, explanation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, up until that big M&A at Lionbridge, no, I didn't. Maybe it's also because I was unaware. My, my, my antennas might not have been really right. tuned into this, right? I was working and getting promoted. Life was good and, you know, I was successful. Um, but then I was like, I mean, some of the stuff that happened today, you would report to HR, there would be a harassment suit. And I'm not just saying for a small thing, I'm talking big stuff, right? And that really opened my eyes. My reaction at the time initially was emotion. If it happened today, I would I would behave in a different manner. But at the time, it was upsetting. You were angry. To I was angry. And I was like, at some stage, I was a little scared, I have to say, with some of the behaviors that people coming to my... I mean, I'm not going to go into the deal, but it was really kind of a moment where I was going home and saying, oh, my goodness, I don't know if I can come back in tomorrow morning. What's going to happen tomorrow? And some of the stuff I was schooled. And I mean, I had... To me, it was like a huge shock. I had never expected this. And after the emotion, I thought, you know what? This is just, I, I didn't see a way for it to improve unless I stayed for a lot. I mean, a lot of things would have had to happen to improve within a, a reasonable amount of time. And I said, you know, life is too short for this. So I left the company and that was a smart move I did. And in the company I went to, it was in Central Europe then. Um, and the owner was a woman. Right. But the thing that was very interesting is that when they, they run a CEO um, uh, race, you could call it race or whatever, like they were a CEO selection, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and I was pregnant and she's the one who told me, oh, you probably don't want to run for it because you're expecting. So again, and she didn't mean badly, but this bias right. where so that I, so I, for, for a period of time, it coincided actually with me becoming a mom. 
that was kind of if I kind of look at that timeline and this kind of maybe association of ideas that people had. Oh, you know, she's a mother. She's not going to work as hard or, you know, uh, oh, she's pregnant. How can she become CEO? So there was these things happening. And then and then when I was uh, CEO in the, in, the, in, the, in the previous company, I think that was, I didn't ask for it. It was on merit, I think, that they, they and, but the thing, though, is that there was a preparation ground. So when I came into this company, same pattern where the company was at a certain level, not making money. And they said, we need you to come in, fix and grow and get to the next level. And, and then straight away from the beginning, we kind of run. So the, the CEO at the time, uh, him and I, we kind of run the company. So I took care of everything around strategy and business and marketing, commercial I need to care more of the financial stuff, you know? So we work very well together. And then what happened is that we flipped. So I became CEO and he stayed as CFO. And that's what he wanted. He, I, I remember him saying, you know what? It's time to give the baton. We've been working together, you know? And, and for him, it's like, you're the better person. Right. To, to and unfortunately, then that was very soon after and, that. And, uh, yeah, and then, and then soon after that, the company got sold. And there again, I was very surprised that it was bought by a Nordic uh, country. And I always had this idea of very egalitarian society. Right, exactly. And, and it wasn't, I mean, board meetings was me and 15 guys. And I thought this is, 20, <laughs> you know, 2019. It's, it's, so I, I, I don't want to complain because I do think we've made tremendous progress, mm-hmm. right? Because if you look at 100 years ago, 50 years yeah. ago, 20 years ago. So yeah, you yeah be, I don't know, you know Veronique, you, just, you drew my attention to something um, at some point early on when you were joining or you joined or I can't remember at what point, but you said that I can't remember the, but the number, cause we're one of the 50 biggest companies in the, in, yeah. in the space. And I think you were like one of only, maybe there would be one other one that was actually appointed as CEO yeah. in that top yeah. 50. And so, you know, I'm sorry. And this is a shout out. I don't know if how many people will watch from our industry, but like, you know, we are maybe great on one level, but, and this is not patting myself on the back, honestly, at all, but like, why don't we have more female CEOs? I mean, that's, since we have way, a huge percentage of women in the industry, I think it's kind of appalling that there's such a, a small number of, and, that, and when you, and I had never thought about it until you, you pointed no, it out and, to me. And this, I was just like, and you know what? And this is what's great because that permeates in the culture of Argos. In Argos, what I've seen is not, it doesn't matter if you're blue, you're white, you're, you know, whatever, you know, it's what you contribute to the business. We have many blue people. A couple. (laughs) (laughs) But you know what I mean is that you, it's all about, you know, what, what, what's your talent, you know, what's the best talent. And Mm. I think that's super healthy because I don't think, you know, in my previous company, I remember a survey was done and there were comments from women that really surprised me that actually we're saying we're not represented. So they were, it was an issue. Yeah, I don't like the, re- the idea. I, I have to be honest. I don't like the idea of quotas and representation. That really bugs me. It's just anti, um, and I know that this is maybe something that needs to be to correct, to be, to do things, sure. as you said, more in agalitarian way, but because like, why not just have the best possible people? It just, I just don't see, I, but maybe I, the problem I, is um, it's not objective. I mean, I, 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 I see the quotas as a kind of a, a quick fix for a period of time to correct an imbalance. If right. there's a blatant imbalance, but I do not think that is the, the, the solution to, you know, a long-term problem. I do think it can be used as a kind of a, point, a spot solution, get things to evolve, and then uh, and, and then it should really kind of start taking. You know, yeah, from there. I know it's just people's mindset. I mean, I guess I guess my problem is I can't get into other. You know, you're, it's really a mindset change. And absolutely, uh, all, and you know, so what are you going to do if everybody and has time? A mind? Time, you know, right? Twenty years ago, fifty years ago, hundred years ago. It's about how do we shift the perspective. And, and to me, it's about awareness without whining about it or complaining, you know, okay, do, it's not about emotion anymore, right? It's about what do you do about it? And then, you know, how can you help others? Right. Um, by leading by example, by supporting, mentoring, there's a number of things that can be done to us. Uh, mm. And you, to I want to talk about how you handle change that you, and also draw attention to the importance of recognizing that 
when a company gets bought or sold, this is a moment of tremendous change. And going back to, I think you were in the Dublin office when it was acquired and you were very emotional, upset, and your mentor, your boss said, right, stop crying. What are you going to do exactly. about it? And, but um, do you think that, you know, whether it's a, a female thing or your, your ability to handle change and see change as an opportunity and, and a lesson for anyone listening, if you're working for a company that gets bought or sold, you know, I had a, an incredible story of how to handle acquisitions where the... Mm -hmm the guy giving the workshop was someone who worked in corporate acquisitions, regularly buying companies. And he said, you know, the first thing you have to do over the weekend is decide who's keeping a job and who's not keeping a job. And you have to gracefully or how are you going to do it? Fire the people who are going to fire. But then you get everyone else into the room. And the only question they're going to have in their mind is, do I still have a job? And you can talk about strategy and everything. And the only they're, they're going to say, yeah, stop talking about the strategy. Do I still have a job? And he said, you can tell them 10 times, everyone in the room, has kept their job and they'll still be worrying is it really true yeah. but so you know sometimes the, the basics are important but how did you how, how, do you think you were good at it, handling these these massive changes and seeing them as opportunities compared to other people did that account for your account for your success compared to other people and what's that to do with you being a woman um i don't think it has anything to do being a woman or a man i think it has to to be to do about <clears throat> you're understanding yourself and what you want. Because at the end of the day, that's how I handled it. I don't know if it was the right way, but I thought, hold on, you know, that's what I can bring to this business. This is where I see this business headed. Do I believe that I can, one, contribute and be happy in this job, right? That I feel like, you know, because what does it mean to be happy in, your, in, in the job is that I do think it's because not just you get your paycheck, but you, you know, you see you have a contribution and that people respect that and, and they value you and you value your colleagues, right? So I always looked at, you know, how do I fit in this new environment? It didn't bother me that it was a new environment. Things change all the time. But then it's like, you know, you were talking about strategy. I kind of really looked at that culture and say, will I be able to strive in there as me, right? Others might. And I saw, in all fairness, a lot of people say they look at their job. They want to keep the job. I never had fear of not finding employment. Sounds really arrogant, but I thought, hell, if I need to work in the fast food, I'll do it. I, you know, it, it was more about, I believe that um, there is always a way. And it might be from this, this entrepreneurial background and my parents that they always found a way when they had to change the business. Mm. My husband is an entrepreneur. God, he went, he went through many, many different business models and ideas before it worked you know i think that you need to fail probably 10 times before you you know you kind of hit hit it right so i always thought there is a way um and and i do think it's about you as a human your identity and what you want and my recommendation was always to say to people what is it you want and when somebody and i had you know in his m a richard i, I had people coming to me upset kind of you know do i have a job and i was always using this technique i call it the so what technique and i said okay if you lose you know oh i might lose my job on monday so what oh but uh, i won't be able to pay the rent so what you know things like that she's just gonna say is it that bad or maybe you can do something about it mm. so. and you mentioned um in one of the companies, I, you, it was an American company or your boss was American mm -hmm. and there was this can-do attitude. Mm -hmm. And the, the translation industry is, has a lot of women, maybe not a, a, mm -hmm. not a, in the CEO role, but it, throughout the industry. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different, almost in, obviously, there are a lot of different nationalities in translation because yeah. very often people go into the translation because mm -hmm. they come from one country and they live in another. There's that sort of, it's a really great industry from that point of view. And... So do you think, and you refer to this American attitude, and now you're talking, as a European, you're talking about the sort of, your, maybe it came from your parents, this sort of can-do mm -hmm. attitude. Yeah. So do you see the, could you just reflect on what you think about the American business culture? Because, you know, Keeman is American. The company was founded by American, but grew up in Europe. And But our, major, mm -hmm. our biggest market is America. Mm -hmm. So uh, can mm -hmm. you reflect on that a little bit? Um, what I've picked up compared to maybe not all countries in Europe, because every country in Europe may have a different way of doing business. But what I found that I always kind of related to in the US is that I always find it was slightly easier to do business, a little bit of a shorter time to making a decision, a little bit more of a willingness to take a risk. 
uh, to try new things. I, I've always picked that up. And, it, and I always joke that it kind of starts from Silicon Valley, moves across the US and then comes to Europe. Now in Europe, you also have hubs of innovation. And I think young people also, their attitude is changing, but definitely this kind of American way of doing business, it's about business, right? Um, and and yeah, I, I, I just felt it generally also things like getting referrals. You know, people will say, yeah, you do a good job. I'll give you. So all this kind of business mentality that people feel it's normal to help one another or support one another, but also they, it, it's very, um, I think it's a bit more direct. That's the second thing, right? It's kind of a bit shorter time to decision, but also a bit more direct. Um, you have to understand how people communicate. You might have to read a little bit between the lines, but you know, you know what's going on. I think that sometimes in Europe, it's a little bit more difficult to decipher depending on, you know, on, on the countries. So, Fran um, France is super hard. France, uh, so, sorry, uh, France is, I mean, I'm French, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Unless you're a French company in France, right. Franco-French, it is not easy. I think Germany may be a little bit to that extent. We work with enterprise, so maybe it's a little bit different, but definitely at SME level, hard. But, uh, but you know, I, I say... And in, in Europe, there's an expression DAC, which is Deutschland, Austria, and yeah. Switzerland. And, you know, I, I say that you can be an international company. You may be Japanese, but provided your, your head of sales for DAC is Wolfgang Schmidt, yes. and, and, you know, <laughs> you know, you can be. Yeah, but you also need to be invoicing from a GmbH. Yes. Well, Wolfgang uh, needs to be invoicing from the GmbH. The Germans will like to do the business with the Germans. There's a, there's a very cultural thing. Um, there. I do agree with you, Veronique, about the American, um, and this isn't because of Amer in fact, Argos is not at all, I, I actually don't know what Argos is because I never worked in an American company in my life. So I don't know what was created, what, what kind of a bastard child was created <laughs> in there. But anyway, I, I wanted to just completely shift gears here and ask you, so you, you've, 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 joined, uh, you've joined Argos, You've been approaching a year now as the uh, as the CEO. Um, I know I, I have the feeling. I think I can confidently say you feel comfortable. You feel at home. You fit. Um, you fit in the yeah, company. Yeah, you fit in. And no, but I mean, you know, the, the, the major. You know, as Richard uh, alluded to, a, a really a major equity um, uh, investment as well. A big. You're a big shareholder of the company, and you, basically, this is your home now for whatever the foreseeable next period um, of your career. Uh, and I've had this incredibly cool and awesome career um, that we've just talked about. So I'm just wondering, where are you going to take this? Uh, what's your plan? Like, where are you going to take this thing? Uh, uh, this could be like an internal strategy meeting with the business <laughs> broadcast. No, but I think, it's, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. Like, what are you going to do? Like, what, you know, obviously, don't let's just uh, be aware that not everybody's a localization person here. So sure. we're just on a very high level. But where are you going to take this business? Um, mm hmm uh, you know, I had the chance of knowing you, Kimon, for a long time, and then I got to, to, to meet you, Richard. So when I started in, in, in Argos back last May, the first thing I did was actually to share with all of the employees vision and strategy. Not that I pulled out of thin air, but from understanding the company, kind of being a little bit of the corridor of the company before joining. And my, 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 my views, and, you know, of course, which I shared with, with Kimon and a couple of other people in the organization is that, you know, I'm a growth leader. I want to grow the company and we have a plan to get, you know, first mile is like to, the first uh, step is to get to a hundred million, which is a big, fat, ambitious goal. Right. Um, but I really want us to be the most reputable organization for language services for the enterprise business, because it's not just about quantity. It's about quality. I want really the, you know, the buyers, the customers to recognize us for that. The most reputable. What does it mean? It means like we're the ones that always find a solution and actually adapt, you know, find solutions to their problems and kind of help them going global in an easier manner. And I see, you know, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a big departure from what Argos already had planted as seeds, right? It's really scaling that and, and, um, and, and taking this to the next level. Um, and I do think that we do have, in my opinion, somehow a differentiator in this personalization or customization of how we deal with, with customers. And we've done this exercise on a marketing level to figure out this differentiation because you said it, Richard, it's a very fragmented business. There's a lot of companies, oh, you're a translation agency. What is it that you do differently or what is this extra ingredient in the sauce? 
that gives you, you know, that, that, that special flavor. And you didn't mention the word technology and there are some animals in this <laughs> industry and, you know, a lot of, you go to conferences and there's industries that might be destroyed by artificial intelligence and mm -hmm, machine mm -hmm, translation mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. machine learning and translations on the, everyone's heard of Google Translate. Google Translate is sure. a lot better than it used to be <laughs> in case you right. haven't checked in the right. last five years. Right. Um, so I use you, it every day. <laughs> right, yeah. And so do you, do you think that, I mean, and, you know, maybe you should reflect on the scale we are at the moment. Do you do you see that technology is part of? You know, would we be a, become a pure technology company or merge with a technology company or buy one or how how, how would that technology fit into your goal of? Because uh, when you say hundred million, you mean hundred million dollars or euros or yes. pounds or zlotys? Not zlotys, no, no, not zlotys. Dollars. Yeah. <laughs> dollars. Okay. Well, the way the dollar is going, maybe we want to go euros, but okay, a hundred million. Um, technology, maybe just a little bit step back on Google. They're the biggest buyer, one of the biggest buyers of translation, right? Themselves. When I work with them back in whatever, 2008, 2008 or something, there was already this fear, oh, Google will take over. And, you know, and yes, they have army of, uh, armies of super smart people who created Google Translate. We're talking kind of corporate or enterprise translation. I think we're not there yet, but technology is intricate to everything we do. How, I, however, I see that technology is an enabler to what we do. It gives us an edge. It gives us a differentiation. It's not what we sell. Maybe it will change along the way. But I see that today for you know, our mission or where we're going, really technology is essential, but it's really the enabler, which is dealing with that triangle that never goes away of time, quality, and cost. And this is what the customers really are always looking at. We talk about digital transformation. What is digital transformation? Doing things faster to a better level of quality that costs less. So it's just a different version of the problem that we're trying to, to solve. So I'm just conscious of time. I do have, uh, we have, we have our classic sort of uh, last ending uh, questions. For me, Veronique, it's um, the one I like to ask everybody is, so you've had this incredibly, um, you know, successful career, basically. I mean, you know, you came from the, from the, the I don't want to say the, the I'm not sure the horticulture or the floors. The, from the glass houses, the glass houses. <laughs> from the glass houses house and the, the uh, and, you know, you worked your way all the way up to, to, to multiple CEO positions and, you know, being the top salesperson in big companies and like just doing lots of successful things. Um, how much of that story, how much of that, how much in, 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 your, in your opinion, how much of that is, is, is dependent on luck? And how much of that is just purely, is that just purely because of your hard work and your skill and your talents? Or is it, is there any, is there any bit of, is there any bit of luck that, 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 that helped you get to, to where you are today? I'd say probably 10% was luck and 90% was luck created from the hard work. <laughs> And what would be the luck? Like, what's an example of the like? Well, I, the I, luck can say, just, I can, I can like, say one just listening to your story, which was the people you worked for, some yeah. of your bosses, your mentors. Exactly. That, that, that was random. That you didn't choose that. That happened. Right? You answered that the question correctly, Richard. Congratulations. That was. Luck. <laughs> I mean, I mean, one of one of the recent luck is to be you know to get to know you, Kimon, ten years ago, and yeah. we met and we got on and we we cultivated. The, 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 you know, the relationship over the years, we would meet at events and there was this natural kind of, um, mm. you know, click that we would chat and talk about business and talk about different things. We realized, hold on, we get on very well because we had a, a similar way of looking at things and also different, mm -hmm. you know, skills or, you know, yeah. kind of complementary. Absolutely. That, that was luck. And then, you know, then that we actually met <laughs> because after that, as you said, <laughs> you and I put in our work to make this luck. <laughs> I mean, ten. It yeah. took us ten years. It took us ten years to get here. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah, but, right. But, but you had you have this you have this moment where you meet someone, somebody because as you say, somebody is your boss and they look out for you. I think that actually is a very big takeaway lesson. Is that you know, and that's what I learned. If my boss doesn't look out for me, I'm not in a good position here. No. I better look somewhere else. No, and I mean on, on luck. I mean, there's an entrepreneur from Cambridge, Alex von Sommer, and he's extremely successful, uh, and probably worth billions of pounds, which may not be worth much in the future, but right now <laughs> that's still worth, worth something. Uh, uh, and he 
he um, had a business called Encipher, and the market were financial services companies in, in the United States. And he, when he set up the company, they were too late to get a stand at the main industry mm -hmm. event for IT security. And so he just flew to San Francisco and was wandering around the hotel, and he, he saw a guy with a Fidelity badge. And he thought, I've heard it. He was a young man. I've heard of Fidelity. And he said, do you work for Fidelity? And the guy said, well, of course. And he said, well, I've got this, I've got this tech that means that you can have – hundreds of people on your website at the same time and your system won't slow down. Is that of interest? He said, that's not of interest to me. But I was in a meeting um, a few days ago and I know that the survey guys are really worried about this. Um, can you stay here? And the guy said, he said, of course. And he said, in about... So he said, half an hour later, six guys with sort of dark glasses, which were sort of fidelity security, showed up. And he said, you know, you can say it was lucky that I saw him, but it wasn't luck that I was wandering around the hotel yes. looking for people. And, you know, even going to the events, looking out for people. I remember for, for, for Argos, I came to fairs and I saw a guy with a Medtronic badge and I followed him into the toilet and followed him out <laughs> of the toilet. Oh my God, that's one of the, you're probably one of the people that, that's why they stopped coming to the events. Yeah. It's people like you that have <laughs> no, scared no, the no, clients no. away from the events. Be careful, no. you're talking to like senior no, localization no, okay. in the okay. world. <laughs> I'd say that you, you ha what you, hard work and being in the right place is not, is uh, obvious things you can control, but it's having your opportunity antenna turned on as well you know it's like mm -hmm. and obviously it's about having relationships talking to people being able to right. engage with them just in case there's an opportunity and helping i think that i i like to help it's just like you know i i, I like the satisfaction that maybe i help somebody and they something good happened or you know mm. that you know it, it, at any level and i think that if you have this mindset that you support somebody you help them etc things come back to you Okay. You don't you don't help for just for something to come back, but you do it naturally, and I think that people go like, "Oh, I will, I'd like to work with this person." So there is that sense of karma. Um, but I, I I wanted to ask you about leadership, and I think one way of thinking about leadership: what is a terrible leader, and what is a good leader? And if you think of, and there are different leadership styles. There isn't like the one and what works for one person. If you sort of think of some leaders you've either reported to or observed who are absolutely terrible leaders what is it about their leadership style that you think is awful you don't have to name names i know no, it's no, probably sure. no but just like what's an example of a bad leader and, and when you think of good leaders and it could be about yourself or someone else you say oh well that that's a good sign that they know how to run things or they're, they're someone who inspires or motivates uh, for me a bad leader is somebody who is stubborn and refuses to listen to different perspectives and and be humble enough to say, well, maybe that's not the right path I chose. And, you know, so that, that this kind of stubbornness, I think that um, you close yourself off. And, and, and second is somebody who doesn't try to, um, who cares, who doesn't care about all the constituents of the business, right? Because your constituents are your customers, your employees, and your investors, right? And if you just focus on one. And I've seen in my career that, leaders who started focusing on all constituents, but then, you know, company got very big and then they focused on one. And I, and then when things got kind of unraveled a little bit, so that this stubbornness and like this, um, you know, not, not on the focus, the lack of focus on the right, the right thing. What makes really good leaders, I can flip that <laughs> and say, yeah. listening, mm -hmm. listening to opinions, people, then you make up your mind. That's okay. And you know, you execute whatever, but kind of being open-minded is one caring and i don't know I, and i think that is like it's not whether you're a man or a woman or where you come from i think caring and and be genuine makes a good leader people can feel that and relate to you i think that's that's that would be like too big and and the third part in, in a good leader is being a couple of steps ahead always you know we, because at the end of the day you've got to drive a business and um you got to be always very much, you know, uh, having all your antennas out to see what's going on. And, and so this curiosity and understanding what's happening helps you being two steps ahead. Curiosity is a very important yeah. skill for entrepreneurs. Yeah. And so you know, reading, you know, like I, I heard from your previous podcast, you know, oh, would you, yeah. and I think that today we're so lucky. We have all these resources. And, and, I, and I really think that um, you don't know what you don't know. So every day you should try and learn something, right? 